Good morning. It's 9 o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here. There's a lot of other places you could be on a Sunday morning, and we're very thankful that you're here to worship God and to learn more about His Word. Uh, we've been studying in the book of Revelation so far. Um, last week, we looked at Revelation chapter 2. We worked through uh, about the first 13 verses, talking about some of the, the first few churches there, and uh, we're going we're gonna to pick up in about verse 14 this morning. Uh, like always, there's a sign-up sheet in the back for the notes. Um, earlier this, well, last week, I sent out all my notes through the introduction, chapter 1, chapter 2, I think all the way through to the end. Um, so we're going to be picking up in chapter 2, verse 14, maybe getting into chapter 3 this morning, and so we're going to go through it. So last week, um, we, we looked at the first churches. What are the churches we looked at in chapter 2 last week? Ephesus, all right. Smyrna, okay. Okay, and then we started into uh, Pergamos, Pergamum, depending on your translations, all right. So we talked a little bit about Satan's throne in uh, chapter 12, or verse 12. What did we discuss Satan's throne? What's the possibility for why that was named that? Yeah, so many false gods, right? Satan's throne, Satan's seat. Uh, we talked about how Zeus, Athena, Asclepius, or Asclepios, uh, what, what was the interesting thing about Asclepios, that god? It was a, what, serpent on a pole. What's one possible origin of that Greek god? Moses in the, in the desert, right? The fact that that, uh, that serpent that they lifted up to be healed uh, later had become something in Second Kings where they had begun to do what to it? Worship it like a false god, right? And they called it Neshitan, right? Uh, which means a brazen thing, okay? So... Uh, let's go ahead and pick up here in uh, Pergamos, all right? We talked about how, uh, in the notes I have some more resources and references if you want to do some more personal study. Uh, J.T. Marlin uh, wrote a book called The Seven Churches of Asia, which for chapters two and three is probably my favorite book to go through. And it gives a lot of historical information about the cities. Um, and so one of the things I like the most about Pergamum is, uh, has anyone heard of the word parchment? What's the word parchment? What does it reference? Okay, Okay. scrolls, if something was writing material. And it's actually uh, interesting that the, the, the word parchment comes from the Latin term uh, paper of Pergamum. And the reason is because uh, Lydia, which is where uh, Pergamus was, they used to get all of their uh, papyrus writing from where? Egypt, right? And Egypt had a famous library, the library of what? Alexandria, right? Well, the king of, uh, of Lydia, Pergamus, tried to steal the librarian. Back then, libraries were really popular, right? It's like, um, where, where's all the information now, a lot of it? Internet, right? Okay. Yeah, internet's pretty popular, right? What about if you didn't have an internet? You had to go somewhere, you'd go to where? A library, okay? Books were a lot more expensive in antiquity. You didn't normally have a big library of your own, right? So the king tried to bribe and steal the librarian from uh, Alexandria. What do you think, how do you think that the Egyptian rulers, what do they think they thought about that? They didn't like it, so they basically said, we're not giving any more papyrus to the people up in uh, Pergamum, right? So they had to develop their own way uh, to, to write. And so they developed, they started working on animal skins, right? And they actually found out later that this was even a better method than the parchment, right? But that's where the word parchment comes from, okay? It comes from the, um, I can't remember the Latin term, I have it in the notes, um, but uh, Pergamina Charta, which means paper of Pergamum, right? So that's where parchment came from. There's a lot of really cool historical facts in some of these cities. Sometimes we just read the name of it and browse right past it, right? But there's a lot of really cool history uh, that makes it interesting to study, okay? Let's go ahead and pick up in verse 14. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of who? Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. What's the story of Balaam in the Old Testament? Okay. Okay. So Balak was the king of who? Moabites, right? Uh, Numbers 22 is where that story starts. It goes through the end of 24, but basically, uh, Balak, uh, and the names can kind of get confusing at first, but Balak says, he sees the people of Israel, and he says, they're going to lap us up like they've lapped everybody else up, so we need to find a way to curse them. 
And so Balak says, we need to call Balaam. And he uh, basically calls Balaam, and Balaam comes. It's the story of the donkey, right, where God uh, opens up the donkey's mouth. Uh, later in one of the other Old Testament accounts, it talks how God allowed the donkey to speak as a man. So it's not this idea. I, I remember growing up wondering, like, can all animals speak? And God just had to open up their mouth? No. It was God miraculously speaking through this animal, right? So he, anyway, he gets there, and he tries. Balak wants him to curse Israel how many times? Three or four, okay. Wants him to curse Israel, and what does Balaam say? Can't do it. I can't curse him, right? He blesses them, right? It's what God tells him to say, right? And then in chapter 24, you really don't get all the information about Balaam, right? You basically just sort of seems like Balaam won't curse him, and then it goes into chapter 5. Go to chapter 25 in Numbers really quickly. Let's look at what happens in Numbers chapter 25 and verse 1. Now Israel remained in the Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So a lot of time with pagan idol worship, they would what? Sacrifice meat to idols, and they would do what with it? They would eat it, all right? And so in this case, that's something that's happening, and they're also committing harlotry, all right? Sexual immorality. Verse 3, Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Now, what happened after this? Plague, 24,000 people died. And this is the story where Phineas caught one of the men of Israel with a Midianite, and he went into the tent and what? Rammed a spear through it, right, to end the sexual immorality, right? Now, you don't really read much more about Balaam in chapter 25, okay? But go ahead and flip over to um, Numbers 31. Go to Numbers chapter 31. Numbers 31 and verse 6, I believe it is. Let's see. Okay, they took vengeance on the Midianites, verse 2. Verse 6, then Moses sent them to war, 1,000 from each tribe. He sent them to war with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. All right? Verse 7, they warred against the Midianites as the Lord had commanded. They killed all the males. Look at verse 8. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. Balaam, the son of Baor, they also killed with the, the, the sword, all right? So Balaam is killed here, right? Okay. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15 says that Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness, okay? Uh, Joshua 13, 22 talks about Israel killing Balaam, all right? Now go all the way to Nehemiah. Nehemiah 13, 2. Nehemiah 13.2 says, Because they had not met the children of Israel with bread, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, God turned the curse into a blessing. So whenever they heard the law, they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. All right? So whenever you go through the Old Testament, you see a lot of things about Balaam. What's pretty much the overarching thing? He was wicked. Okay, what else? He loved money. Now in Numbers 31.16, listen to what it says. These women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam, that's Numbers 31, 16, to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. So chapter 25, 1 through 3, Balak has wanted them to curse. Balaam won't curse them. But then in chapter 5, they just, out of the blue, start what? Joining themselves to Baal of Peor. They start committing sexual immorality, eating this food sacrificed to idols, right? Now, you don't get to chapter 31, 16, where it tells you that Who actually counseled them to do that? Balaam did, right? So you don't get that until Numbers 31, 16. Throughout the Old and New Testament, you see that Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness, 2 Peter, okay? But he's the one that actually counseled them. He said, you know what? It seems like if you put all the facts together, he wanted this money, even though he said, I can only tell you what God says. I won't curse him because God tells me to bless him. But for some reason, he still wanted the money. So what does he in essence do? He says, I can't curse them for you, but you know what might work? It might work if you were to maybe seduce them with women, tempt them with women, and what ends up happening? That's right. There's a plague, 24,000 people die, right? Okay, now let's take all that context back into Revelation, all right? Let's go back to Revelation 2.14. I have a few things against you. You have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit what? 
fornication, sexual immorality, all right? What do you think he's saying to this church here? Just like in the Old Testament, the people sinned because they were what? They were taught, right? Eat things sacrificed to idols, commit sexual immorality. What do you think is going on in this church here in the first century? The exact same thing, right? You have somebody, remember we talked last week about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? In the notes, I have a whole lot of quotes from early writers, okay? Non-inspired, but some of the early church writers, some people call them the early church fathers, okay? I like to call them early church writers, but uh, they wrote about all these things, the Nicolaitans, right? We talked about the origin of that name, the possibilities. Uh, It's all in the notes that we covered last week. But they had a similar sort of thing, which was what? They were teaching people it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit what? Fornication, because their idea was your desires came from who? From God, therefore you should what? Indulge them, right? God wouldn't have given you these, these desires if you weren't supposed to indulge them, right? The devil always takes what God made. Did God make sexual desire in a marriage holy? Yeah, Hebrews says what? The marriage bed is pure and undefiled. The devil always takes what God made holy and tries to do what? Pervert it, twist it, right? And so you have this thing here. Look at verse 15. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So it seems like this church there had some people who were teaching it's okay to eat meat, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. And normally in the first century in these uh, Greek cities, Roman cities, okay, uh, over in Asia Minor, those were associated with what kind of worship? Idol worship, false gods. That's why he says Satan's seat, okay? So when you put all these things together, he's saying, hey, there are some people that are still teaching the same sort of thing, just like Balaam did, okay, just like Balak used, that the people of Israel fell victim to in the Old Testament, and we talked about how Revelation alludes a lot to what? The Old Testament, to make its points, okay? Look at verse 16. What's a common theme to five of the seven churches? Repent. What's going to be a common theme later in the book of Revelation? Uh, We'll get to it, but the plague sent on Rome, I believe, is meant to get them to what? Repent, right? That's a pretty common theme, not only in the book of Revelation, but where? Human history. That's right, okay? Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth, okay? Uh, Some people think that verse 16, where it says them, is referencing the Nicolaitans, or those people holding to the doctrine of Balaam, okay? Those people, it seems... Uh, at least some of the, the ones teaching it must have been where? In the what? In the church, right? That's, that's one of the biggest threats a lot of times. We've always got the threat of people coming from outside. But even Paul in Acts 20 warned about people that would rise up from where? Within, right? Which is why you guys should check every single word I say, right? I mean, it's true. Every single person that gets up here in front of us, whether it's Robert, whether it's one of the elders, whether it's one of the Bible class teachers, you've got to be on, on guard, right? You do. All right. Verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. What's the the, uh, relevance of manna in the Old Testament? That's right. It's what sustained the Israelites when they were wandering in the wilderness. Okay? And I will give him a white stone. White stones, um, there's a lot of different... um, a lot of different explanations if you go and look up uh, this, but it seems like white always represented what? Purity or innocence. Um, I've read a lot of uh, primary sources from the early centuries that would talk about when they would vote in court, the white stone would be what you'd vote for someone who's innocent, okay, not guilty. Um, there's some people that would even say in the Old Testament, the high priest, right, he had, uh, what did he have on his chest? Yeah, he had 12 stones, and then uh, there's also... Uh, I forget where I read it. I don't have it in my notes. I'll try to find it and add it. But they would talk about they'd have different stones, the Urim and the Thummim, right, the two stones, okay, which is one of the ways God would give them decisions, okay. Um, And look at the last thing he says. I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it, all right. given a new name. Um, Lots of different people take different approaches. Some people think, okay, this is referencing God gives you a new name. That indicates something what? Something changed. But also, um, let's say me and Dwayne, I say, Dwayne, you know, what if, if Dwayne and I are such good friends that I got a nickname for him, right? What does that, what does that show? Closeness, right? Yeah. 
I mean, it's like when I'll talk to somebody and I'm like, well, his name is what? Why do you call him this? Well, there's a story behind that, right? It's closeness. So maybe it's the idea that God's giving them a new name. Uh, did God give anybody a new name in the Old Testament? Abram, Abraham, Sarah, Sarai, right? Jacob, Israel, okay? God always gave these people a new name that he seemed to have a pretty close relationship with, okay? Maybe that. Uh, there was a prophecy in the Old Testament, Isaiah 62, 2, that God would give people a new name. Uh, a lot of people think that um, that was fulfilled in Acts eleven twenty six, when the name Christian was given. You know, I, I've probably said this before. My favorite thing about that is they weren't given the name Christian in Acts eleven twenty six until who'd been brought into the church? The Gentiles, right? So God waits till Jew and Gentile in the church gives them a new name, okay? Uh, each one of those things is a possibility to what it's referencing. God is going to give them something special, all right? Is it literally a new name, or is most of Revelation what? Figurative, symbolic, okay? Look at Revelation 21.8. Moving into, any, any comments about that church before we move into verse 18? Questions, comments? Mm-hmm. Yeah, not innocent, not guilty. That's right. Okay, let's look at verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, and this is the longest of the seven letters, all right, the longest letter. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. What did we say that the makeup of each letter is? It's what, a like if you'd write a letter to somebody, you'd be a, a greeting? And then what? He's going to address the things that are good, the things that are bad, okay? And then he's going to give them a promise of a blessing at the end, okay? So this is who? Who's, who are all these letters to the church from? Yeah, the Son of God, right? John is the revelator, and that is given to him by who? Okay, that's right. The church of Thyatira, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. We saw that description in chapter 1, okay? Uh, Thyatira, that was the home of somebody that we read about in the New Testament. Who would that be? Lydia in Acts chapter 16, okay? Um, she was a seller of purple. Historically, you can go back and look, and this, this city was famous for its production of purple uh, or red dye. Uh, it's called Turkey Red. And uh, I did a little research, and one source said it took 120 pounds of these little uh, mollocks, I think was the name of the crustaceans, to make one gram of this purple dye. Uh, someone else said it took 10,000 seashells, right? Um, anyone know how much gold is an ounce today? Not today, but recently. It's been teetering about eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars an ounce, right? So if you were to do the price of gold per gram, it would be about sixty-two dollars a gram. Um, this stuff, this purple dye, you can even buy it apparently from a place in Germany right now for twenty-five hundred dollars a gram. So gold is sixty-two dollars a gram, and this stuff costs twenty-five hundred dollars a gram, right? So it's more expensive than gold, right? And so that's why you can see Lydia, if she's a seller of purple, she's probably selling to some pretty high up. I read one source that said in Rome, uh, one source said it was illegal for anyone other than the, Ro only the Roman emperor could wear purple. Now, then other sources said it was the emperor or anybody of high class, right? Mainly because who could probably only afford it? Rich people, right? Okay. So look at verse 19. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience, and as for your works... The last are more than the first. So according to their works, were their works diminishing or were they growing? They were growing, okay? Verse 20, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman who? Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Who is Jezebel in the Old Testament? Ahab's wife, right? She was the daughter of the Zidonians, King Ethbal, right? And so good reputation, bad reputation? Bad, okay? Uh, some commentators will say they think there was actually a woman named Jezebel, and I think that's probably the minority position. Uh, it seems like just in the previous church, he compared them to what? An Old Testament story. So is the woman's name Abs Jezebel? Is that her literal name? I, I doubt it. I could be wrong, right? It's happened before. You can ask Jamie. Um, but it's likely an Old Testament reference, okay? 
And so he, Jezebel was a wicked woman. In the notes, I have more. You can go back and read about her, 1 Kings 21. She was the one that, remember the 400 prophets of who? Baal, right? Uh, she was the one that kept them at her table. So she obviously had some, she fed 400 different prophets of Baal, right? She took care of them, okay? And so likely it's comparing, just like in the Old Testament, Jezebel supported these false prophets and basically against the truth. Now you have a woman there that's calling herself a prophetess, okay? Um, and she's teaching these people to do what? What are the two things? Sexual immorality, fornication, eat things sacrificed to idols. Kind of similar to what history says the Nicolaitans taught, similar to what you have this idea of Balaam in the, in the last chapter, okay? So you have these sort of common themes in a lot of these first century churches. Why would that be common in all these different areas? That's what they did. That was a regular thing back then, right? Uh, some of the cities would have trade guilds, right? What's a trade guild? What's a union today? Group of workers doing the same thing, right? Uh, in some uh, occupations, if you're a part of the union, it gives you what? Like strength and power, sort of, okay? Uh, back then, they had trade guilds, and a lot of times, these trade guilds meetings would have the idea of you'd offer meat to an idol, right? And you would eat it. And so if you were going to partake of that as a Christian... Should you have been partaking of that? No. So if you didn't partake of the trade guild, what happens to your business? You're not going to do as well, right? So who knows what Jezebel was teaching? Maybe she taught something. False teachers are always a lot more tricky than we sort of make them out to be, aren't they? Right? You, you think, you know, oh, well, baptism is not essential. Well, 1 Peter 3.21 says it is, and that's, you know, that's, that's all you need to remember. And then you meet a false teacher, and what does he do? Twists and turns and brings in all these other passages. Uh, what, I wonder if Jezebel said something like, well, God said you're supposed to provide for your families, right? This is, this is, this is my complete Aaron's opinion, right? God said you're supposed to provide for your families, right? So what happens if you don't partake of these trade guilds? Your family's not going to eat, right? And Yeah, maybe the stuff that's going on, you, know, you shouldn't, but you know it's just meat, right? I don't know. That's just my assumption, right? I try to think through, well, what would this actually look like to where it would actually be deceiving members of the church, right? Okay. So the pagan cults of the day were obviously in Thyatira, and they would, uh, these trade guilds would have meetings where they would eat meat sacrificed to idols, etc. Right? You see a sort of a common theme. Okay? Look at verse 21. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Does God give everybody a chance to repent? He does. Verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. Uh, was these people that, were these people that committed actually with her, or was it more alongside her, right? The things she was teaching, they were engaging in, right? Either way, God says what? He's going to take care of it. So they need to better, they better do what first? Repent, okay? Verse 23, I will kill her children with death. What do you think it means, her children? The ones that are following her. Remember in John 8, what did Jesus, they said, we're the, we're the children of Abraham, right? And Jesus said what? No, you're not. If you were the children of Abraham, you'd do what? You'd be following the things that I'm saying, but instead, you're the children of what? Your father, the devil. Or they literally, no, spiritually, the way they were acting, they were the children of, uh, of the devil, right? I think that's what it's saying here. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your works. Do our works matter to God? You better believe they do. If you've read the New Testament, you know our works matter to God. We live in a world that all over the place will take a passage like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace through faith, not of works. And is that a beautiful passage? Absolutely it is, and it's inspired, and we shouldn't shy away from it just because some people interpret it wrongly. But they'll take that to mean, well, look, as long as you believe, what you do doesn't really matter, right? The New Testament does not teach that, okay? I'll try to stick to the text and not launch off into another sermon. Verse 24, now to you I say, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, what's sort of been discussed already? Yeah, eat and meat sacrificed to idols, which you see Jezebel, okay, earlier in the early church, Nicolaitans, okay, Balaam. As many of you as do not have this doctrine, eating things sacrificed to meat, sexual immorality, who have not known the depths of who? Satan, as they say. It almost seems like he's saying, as those people that follow it, you know, they say, oh, this is, you think this is the depths of Satan? Maybe, maybe it's like a, um, oh, uh, 
trying to think in one of the, in Romans, I think it is Paul says, as they say, right? They talk about how uh, all these people are accusing Paul of certain things. Let us sin, uh, continue in sin, that grace may abound. It seems like maybe this is something that those false teachers would said, okay, about the depths of Satan, right? Or maybe it's something that they described it as. Maybe the faithful members described it as the depths of Satan. Either way, he's saying this false doctrine is associated with who? Okay, Satan. As they say, I will put, put on you no other burden. So he says, you guys are growing in works, but your problem is what? There's this false doctrine in the church. and you need to, Those people that are engaged in it need to repent of it, and you need to do what? You got no other burden. That's really the main problem that he has with this church, right? Comments or questions? Uh, in the notes, uh, I have a lot of quotes about um, Gary Summers spoke at the Denton Lectures years ago. It's a good commentary book that I have. And uh, I have a lot of his notes uh, in my notes talking about Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism from the Greek word gnosko, which means to know. They claim they had this special superior knowledge, um, which you should always be careful of. If somebody comes along and says, hey, everyone's got it wrong, and I figured something new out, that's probably a sign, right? But the Gnostics had this, uh, this special superior knowledge, and some of them said, we know that spiritual things and physical things are separate, so I can do whatever I want my physical body. It won't affect me spiritually. A lot more in the notes if you want to read that on your, uh, on your own time. Go ahead, Dwayne. Heard it said, if it's new, it ain't true. <laughs> yeah, if it's new, is it true? I remember I heard Johnny Ramsey say, or Roy Deaver for the first time in his old lectures I listened to when I was in my 20s. And they said, if it's new, it isn't true. If it's true, it isn't new. I believe Johnny Ramsey said, if it's not 2,000 year old, 2, years old, it's false. Right? That's, that's pretty simple, isn't it? If it's not 2,000 years old, it's what? Yeah, it's wrong. That's pretty simple. That's never minded, right? No. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7? The way, the way and the life is what? Narrow. I don't have a problem with that. Some people say you're narrow-minded. Well, yeah, about certain things I am. You shouldn't be afraid of that. Yeah. It's a compliment. Yeah, it is a compliment. Yeah. Okay. More notes about Gnosticism in the, in the, uh, in the notes to sign of lists in the back. All right. Revelation 2.25. But hold fast to what you have until I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works till the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Uh, Revelation 11, 15, talks about victory over the nations. Who ultimately is going to triumph over all these world nations? Ultimately, in context, not Rome. But in, in the whole scheme of time, who's going to win ultimately over everybody? Christ. Christ. God is, right? And if you're on his side, then you're going to be what? Yeah. I mean, you think about if you were a Roman citizen at the time, did you sort of, in a sense, with your nation rule over the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, you had special privileges nobody else had, right? Okay. Verse 27. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. Verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. That word rule there is poimeno in Greek. I don't know what word. Well, man, I got translated into the Latin word pastor, which, what's the English word we use for that? Starts with S-H-E-P-H. Shepherd, right? So I will rule them, I will shepherd them, okay? With the rod of iron, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, right? Um, I read one of these words that dashed like the potter's vessels is a reference to a Hebraism, right? What's a Hebraism? It's a common saying, just things that, it's raining cats and dogs, right? You go 2,000 years back in history and say that. I mean, I don't know if they had that back then, but there are some things we have in our culture that we say that really don't make a whole lot of sense unless you know what it means in our culture, right? So this idea of dashing like potter's vessels, it developed from the Egyptian practice of smashing old pottery when a new pharaoh rose to power. So if you had pottery that was, you know, dedicated to X and X died, you had a new pharaoh, what were you going to do? Get rid of that. We want this new pharaoh to think we're... Uh, loyal to him, right? And it was to show the power and reign of one uh, reign ending and another one beginning, right? So a lot of people think that this means that Christ will conquer Rome and the pots of Rome will be destroyed as the new king rises to power as Christ, right? That's what one writer said. Okay. Revelation 2.28, I will give him the morning star later in the book of Revelation 22.16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and what? Morning star, right? I will give him the morning star. I think it's speaking of a relationship. The Bible uses that language a lot. I'll give you 
when he's talking about, yeah, relationship. Okay. Verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the end of uh, chapter 2. Any comments, questions? That is a pretty interesting point. Uh, I've thought about that myself. Uh, what Linda said is, you know, it's interesting in Scripture. You don't really read that much about somebody being unhappy and leaving and going to another congregation. Now, I think we would know that we can't be engaged in false doctrine, right? Uh, when I lived in Morgantown, West Virginia, after college, there was a congregation I went to um, and uh, sat actually with one of the elders who I knew from my father, who was an elder of a different congregation, and uh, went through the whole service and didn't have a sermon. And, uh, but they had a presentation. It was a graduation for the teens. And this is you know, Sunday morning, 1030. And uh, I remember sitting with the elder, and the service ended. And I was kind of confused. And I said, what uh, did, I, did I miss? I mean, I, was, I think I was awake. I mean, I was just out of college, OK? If I'm honest with you, I had a hard time sometimes to stay up late Saturdays. And I said, did I miss the sermon? He said, oh, we didn't think we had time for that this morning. And I said, you didn't have time for the sermon. He said, no, we wanted to honor the team, the, the graduating seniors this morning. And I said, okay. So I started uh, talking with one of the preachers from back home. And he said, you know, Aaron, there's been a lot of other things coming out of that congregation. Um, they were starting to introduce instrumental music and worship. Uh, and that was a point in which I thought, okay, this has got enough false doctrine going on that I can't be a part of it. And so uh, myself and three or four other people planted a new church, right? Okay. There was a big doctrinal issue going on there, right? Um, I think there are times where Scripture would imply that we can't have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. And if that's happening in a congregation, there comes a point in time where you need to what? Leave, right? But unfortunately, it seems like some people sometimes take that way too quickly. It'll be just something small, and they just run off, right? Um, that's unfortunate, because in Scripture, you don't see very many examples of so-and-so not liking this thing going on and them leaving, right? That's a good point, yeah. Okay. Back then, as it is today. That's true, yeah. There's, back then, I mean, I don't know, but you seem like churches met in households. And, um, I'm sure you had more. I mean, in Jerusalem, I'm sure there was, uh, they were gathering together in more than uh, in 3,000 of them, 5,000 of them uh, in different locations. But, uh, but, yeah, we need to be careful. We don't just up and run off at the smallest thing. Right. Okay, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis. Right, this is one of my favorite ones. This is one of my Fun churches, okay, some cool stuff. Do you have the picture? Can you throw the, from the PowerPoint? There's one picture of Sardis up there. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So you have a good what? Name, a good reputation, but really what's going on? You're dead, Right? The city of Sardis was 30 miles or so south of Thyatira. It connected five roads. Uh, it was known for its wealth. Um, when you read through the Old Testament, there's a nation called Lydia, L-Y-D-I-A, and then uh, there was a king named Croesus that ruled Lydia. Um, I believe Lydia is spoken about in Isaiah, about the judgment on it, okay? Um, but anyway, there's a king, Croesus, right? And this was a really rich city. Uh, he was actually one of the first ones to mint gold coins, Okay. And so I have this picture of Sardis up here because um, I think it's a really cool story. So he says, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. You've got a good reputation, but basically what, what you are now is not what you used to be, right? So at the time, this is Sardis, okay? Sardis, all the way back 500 years before they were conquered by Persia, extremely wealthy. The first ones to mint gold coins, right? Uh, it's actually said by one historical writer that when uh, Persia, I think it was Cyrus, conquered uh, Lydia, that he carried $600 million in gold away, right? Now, it's hard to, I'll admit, it's hard to judge well, how much gold back then was worth now. But, you know, one writer said $600 million, right? So give or take a couple hundred million, that's still what? Still a lot of gold, a lot of money, okay? Look at verse 2. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your what? Works. Works important to God? Yeah. I haven't found your works perfect before God, right? Now, that word there for perfect, it's not teleos, which means complete, but it's a different word, P-L-E-R-O-O, -O, which also one of the definitions is complete. He's not saying, I haven't found your works absolutely perfect, spotless, without a single problem. He's saying they're not complete, right? 
When the Bible says be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, does that mean that you can't make a single mistake as a Christian? No. It means morally mature, right? We're supposed to grow and try to become more like God. All right, verse 3. This is the cool verse. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and do what? Repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Now, we see that phrase, I'll come upon you as a thief, thief in the night, throughout Scripture, right? But for the people in Sardis, it had a pretty uh, special meaning, all right? And that would be the history of this city, okay? So I have this image, right, up here. We'll get it in a second. You saw it a minute ago, okay? This is the city of Sardis. Now, what does that look like to you? Does that look like someplace that's going to be really easy to uh, conquer? Not really, right? On three sides of this city, uh, one writer said that the walls of stone and then the cliffs were 1,500 feet high, right? Never been there, tried to find some good images. This is what I think was the best image, right? So at least three walls of those were what? The myth was that they were impossible to what? Yeah, you're not going to, that's not where you're going to conquer and win a battle, right? You're not going to have a 1,500-foot ladder, okay, or whatever. You're going to have to try to approach it on the one side that doesn't have these cliffs, right? And so, historically, guess which is the only side that they guarded? Yeah, the one side, okay? And so history has it that uh, Croesus, the one who minted all these gold coins in like 560 B.C. or whatever, right? He went to this thing called the Oracle of Delphi, right, which was this old like fortune soothsayer oracle that would tell you what you wanted to hear, and they told him that if he crossed this one river, he would destroy a great kingdom. And so he thought, well, if I cross this river, you know who I'm going to destroy? Persia, right? You know what he had, though? He had it backwards. The oracle, although it was probably just made up, ended up being right. He crossed the river thinking he was going to conquer Persia, but who did he actually end up getting destroyed? A great kingdom himself, okay? So this was the capital. Sardis was the capital of Lydia, okay? Some of these facts are probably important to the story, but I know them, and so I forget to tell you, and then you're like, what is he rambling on about, okay? So this is this capital city where Croesus lived, okay? So he crosses the river to go fight Persia, and I believe it was Cyrus, and he took all of his horses, his cavalry. Well, Cyrus knew something pretty important back then was that horses are terrified of camels. And so he sent all his camels out, and what happened to the horses? They stampeded, and Croesus' army got destroyed by Cyrus. So he retreats back to... Sardis, up to this mountain sort of fortress. And so Cyrus and Persia follow them, and they sit there for two weeks trying to think about how they're going to conquer uh, this city, how they're going to get into Sardis, because the one side is narrow and it's really heavily fortified. And so Cyrus says that he'll give a great reward to any man who finds out how to get into Sardis, into the city. And so uh, the man's name, I have him in the notes. Uh, you can read the more... Uh, Hieroides was the guy's name. He watched the city for those 14 days, and one day he saw a Lydian, someone from Lydians, the nation, soldier drop his helmet off that cliff, right, down to the bottom. And then all of a sudden they're watching, and this soldier just appears at the bottom, picks up his helmet, and goes right back up, which would obviously mean what? There's a path down that they weren't aware of. And so he went to Cyrus, and Cyrus allowed him to take a band of soldiers and they went up in the middle of the night, they climbed up to the top of the city, and they got to the top, and guess what? Unguarded, completely unguarded. And so that's how the city fell to Persia, right? And he carried off $600 million in gold, right? So then later, during the reign of Antiochus, okay, which remember we talked about Antiochus during that intertestamental period, the book of Daniel, right? Remember there was one time where the king of Egypt sent his daughter Berenice up to marry one of the Antiochuses? But he was already married, and so he had to divorce his wife, Laodice. Well, guess where the city guy's name from? From her. The city had been named after her, right? Well, she's the one he divorced, and then later she had the woman from Egypt, Egypt murdered and all this, all this family drama, right? That's where the city got its name. Well, during his time, the city had been conquered by Persia and then by Greece, and it had been taken over, and Antiochus went and fought a battle there. And guess what? Same thing. The army he was fighting had uh, all three sides. They had cliffs, and they had the one side that was guarded. And so Antiochus and his soldiers said, hey, this city's famous for back during Persia when, guess what? This Hierodotus did what? Took his men in the middle of the night. And so guess what Antiochus' men did? Thief in the night. They climbed right up this and conquered the city again, right? So this city was famous for having th being conquered as a thief in the night, in the middle of the night, because they were a little too over, what? Overconfident, right? 
So when you take this in the context of what he's saying to this church, you have a really good reputation for what you used to be, right? This city was like the, one of the capitals of the Lydian Empire before Persia took it over, right? And then it gets taken over, and now it's this what? It's like a shell of what it used to be, right? We've got to be careful as a church. We don't do the same thing, you know? What could we easily as a church rest upon? Yeah, well, we did. 50, you know, 50 years ago, we baptized 100 people. That's great. Is that, is that, that's a great thing, isn't it? That is. It doesn't, you shouldn't say, well, that's not great. That is great. But it also implies you should be trying to do what? Same thing now, yeah. You baptize more, if you baptize a little bit less, but you're still trying hard, right? That's exactly what the message is of this, uh, of this story. Look at verse 4. Even though they have a church that is on the brink of what? It's on its deathbed. It says what? You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Sort of kind of what you said about your point earlier, Linda. It'd be, it'd be easy to say, well, this church is really struggling. I need to what? I need to get out of here. I'm not getting, they're not feeding me. Well, I heard someone say what? Babies need fed. Adults what? Get up and make a sandwich, right? If you're not being fed somewhere, then get to work. Do some feeding, right? And so what you have here is he's saying, look, even though there's a church that's got some problems, it's got some issues, there's still a few people there what? Who haven't soiled their garments, right? Which shows a church that has some issues, and yet people still stuck with it to try to work through it, right? Just like Noah, right? There was a few. Just like who? Who else? Noah, just like Lot and his family, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? All these examples in the Bible where sometimes you're going to be the only one, or maybe you'll be a number of a few, okay? Three minutes, all right. Verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. What's that mean, white garments? Purity, okay? Victory. Some people said that uh, Romans or emperors, the Roman emperors would parade in their white togas after victories, right? And this is written in a context of who's ruling the world. Rome is, right? I will not blot out his name from the book of life. What's that mean? We know what that means. The book of life is supposed to be what? Those are in Hebrews 12, enrolled in heaven, right? Uh, Moses even said all the way back in Exodus 32, uh, I think it was, if you will forgive their sin, I, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book. Moses even said, look, I want to stand in the gap for these sinful people. If you can blot me out to save them. Seems like Moses would have been willing to do that. Paul said the same thing in Romans 9. I'd be a curse for my brethren, right? It's this idea that God likes people to do what? Stand in the gap for other people, right? That's what Jesus did, isn't it? Yeah, Moses, Paul, Christ stood in the gap for sinful people, and we're one of them. Or I'm one of them. We're some of them, right? All of them. Okay. The book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. If we confess Christ, he'll do what? Confess us, the way we live. If we don't confess Christ in the way we live, what will he not? Not confess us, right? Verse 6, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, those who forget history are what? Doomed to repeat it, okay? Just like the forces in this city had forgotten about their history and got conquered again, we need to be careful, and maybe we should remember their history, Right? And remember the history of each church and remember what? Don't make the same mistakes that they made. Right? Try to learn from it. So churches need to not forget this story uh, or else we or every other church that reads this may uh, actually repeat the same exact thing. So we'll stop there. Um, we'll pick up in Revelation 3-7 next week with the Church of Philadelphia. Do you have any questions? Anybody have any questions before we wrap up? Okay. Uh, if you have questions you want to talk about, that you don't want to say to the whole group, come find me afterwards. And there's still a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, if you have signed up before and have not gotten an email yet, that means that, no offense, I couldn't read your handwriting. Um, I've tried. I put everybody on the list. One or two of them bounced back. Um, so if you're not getting them, come find me and make sure I have your right email address. And later this week, this video will be up on my YouTube along with all the notes that will go out through I already sent you the notes through chapter 2. I'll send you all the notes throughout the whole chapter 3, which I have. And then we'll finish up in 3-6 and continue next week. So thanks for your attention.